My name is Jan Harzant. I'm the executive director for MUFON. We are a scientific research organization that basically collects sighting reports from the public and then goes and investigates them. Our mission statement as an organization is the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. And we have three primary goals. We investigate UFO reports, we promote research into the UFO subject, and we educate the public on our findings. In 1994, I was uh, going to school at the University of Washington. I uh, happened to go into the bookstore and picked up this book, Above Top Secret by Timothy Good. Happened to turn to page 301 of this book, and there was a short paragraph in there about uh, uh, missiles going down at Nelson Air Force Base in 1967 uh, during a UFO sighting. Uh, I got real excited about that because uh, that's what happened to me. And uh, I thought I was never supposed to talk about this. So here I am talking about it. Uh, but I wanted to explain to you how, it, how I came to this position where I feel I can talk about it. And uh, so what happened was from that point, I contacted uh, MUFON, as a matter of fact in uh, Seattle and uh, ran into James Klotz, uh, co-author of the book, and asked if he could uh, ask the Air Force under the Freedom of Information Act to release some documents about this incident that is highlighted in this book, in just a short paragraph. Um, so he said he would, and, but I said, don't mind say anything about UFOs, we probably won't get much if you do, so he didn't. Uh, and lo and behold, the Air Force wrote back and said, uh, you know, this is still classified. However, since it's been so long, at that time, I think there was a 12-year time period where uh, they had to at least review classified material. Uh, it's, since it's been so long, we're going to go ahead and declassify it. So they did. They started sending us documents on the echo flight, what I call the echo flight shutdown. Uh, so at that point, I decided, because it, I thought that was my incident, it turns out uh, I was not at Echo Flight, I was at Oscar Flight. You know, I'll kind of go into that a little bit. Uh, but I started talking about it, went on the uh, sightings show, they contacted one of my uh, old buddies at Malmstrom, uh, Don Crawford, and uh, he was on the show and James Quads. That's how I, I started talking about this. Then. After I went on the um, coast to coast with Art Bell, I uh, started getting more witnesses coming forward and uh, kind of snowballed from there. Uh, just a little bit more background. The, uh, the reason it was in Timothy Good's book is because Timothy had done an article in the Christian Science Monitor, in, uh, I think it was published in 1972, written by uh, uh, Ray Fowler, I don't know, somebody probably have heard that, Ray Fowler, uh, he was with NICAP, um, and uh, he had gone ahead and given a, a, at the threat of losing his job, he had gone ahead and given an uh, interview to the Christian Science Monitor about these incidents, which he had heard about. So we'll get into that a little bit more. Let's see. Uh, well, I think Jim did a good job of telling you about myself, so I'm just going to skip through this. I, I, I only show this because I want people to know who the heck this is talking to them. Uh, this is uh, kind of a schematic of what Nelson Air Force Base, uh, how it was organized, how the missile field was organized. Uh, uh, Great Falls is about the middle of the state, and uh, I'll point out the two particular sites, Echo and Oscar. There's Echo 1. Oops. There's Echo 1 and there's Oscar. 
Oscar one over there. <laughs> and I'll be going there. <laughs> so we had uh, all these little dots you see uh, were actual uh, launch facilities where the missiles were actually located. Then the bigger dots, what we call LCFs or launch control facilities, where um, uh, uh, two of us would control the uh, web of 10 missiles that were surrounding that, that big dot, that launch control facility. So there were two of us underground. Underground capsule looked something like this. Uh, oh, we'd go down in an elevator. Uh, this looked like a little farmhouse out in the middle of a wheat field. Kind of hard to locate. Oh, thank you. Yeah. How does this work? Push the button. Push the button. Don't point it at the Make sure it's Oh, there it is. Oh, I pointed at me. There it is. So, uh, yeah, we'd go down this elevator and then we'd get locked in this huge, you know, we'd have to go through a procedure to change over. These were manned 24 hours, right? And uh, this was the front gate. We'd have, uh, I don't know, four, five, six security guards up there, and, uh, main guard position right here. We'd keep an eye on that front gate. And we had a perimeter fence. This was supposed to be a hardened site. Uh, and you see we had all this uh, air-cooled equipment down there. Remember, this was 1967. We didn't have these cute little transistors like they have today. We had tubes <laughs> of some sort. And uh, so it had to be air-cooled, and, uh, and we were locked in, like I said, uh, for 24 hours. This was the uh, commander's console. Uh, just point out that we had uh, indicator lights up here that show the status of the missile. Usually it was green, and, uh, and then if the, the uh, missile for some reason malfunctioned, which they rarely did, by the way. This is a very reliable system, uh, state of the art at the time. And uh, we rarely, I was on duty, I, mean, I was on uh, missile duty for three years. And I rarely had a missile go down uh, unintentionally for any reason, any reason whatsoever. Uh, we had triple redundancy on power. We had uh, 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 power company uh, provided power most of the time, and we had uh, battery backup, and we had generator backup. So um, we won't talk about the rest of the stuff here. Uh, the, uh, this is a launch facility. I'll just point out the maintenance bay area in here. Uh, this little personnel hatch in here. And also notice this lid that was over the, the missile itself. Very heavy. Uh, during an actual launch sequence, it would, it would roll back. Uh, and if it got stuck, I think we had the explosive, the explosives to blow it open. But, uh, it was very heavy. Uh, first incident I'll talk about is Minot Air Force Base, 1966, uh, and this is from a Blue Book file. Uh, two objects were uh, observed uh, traveling very slowly back and forth, up and down, uh, from 100,000 feet to 44,000 4, feet, uh, about three and a half hours. Okay. This is. Uh, <clears throat> A uh, letter written by Major Shaw. This was a re uh, just kind of a summary of that report. It was Mike Flight. Um, and he talks about the UFO climbing uh, altitude hovering for 15 minutes. Uh, they had some interference, static disrupted uh, their communications. Uh, and then uh, here's where they uh, sent out a 106 to intercept the, uh, the object. Uh, this is a sketch from uh, Airman Tunney, who was at the facility at the time. 
And this is what he said when he, the first object was uh, uh, seen in front of a cloud. The color of the object initially changed from red, white, and green, I think it says, although the light around the radiate from back side of the object. Uh, this is a statement of Don Crawford, at, and I, I mentioned Crawford earlier. Uh, he was one of the first, uh, the guys I contacted, uh, he sent me a letter saying, uh, saying this uh, uh, a couple of weeks before March 16th. He was on alert at Echo. It was called out of, uh, one of, uh, from a guard from one of the guarded sites. Uh, he said he was seeing something outside the fence. And uh, some objects seemed to be hovering, looking at the site. He approached it uh, and retreated. Something circled the site. Uh, this conversation lasted a long time, maybe an hour. And uh, God, a guard was distressed when he told him that he could use his weapon. Uh, he said he appreciated that, but he didn't take it to it. <laughs> I'll talk about first the Echo Flight incident. That's the incident that I read about in uh, that book above Top Secret. Uh, Captain Eric Carlson and Lieutenant Walter Fiegel were on duty. Uh, and they had maintenance and security crews uh, at two of their launch facilities, two of the ten. They had these people spend the night. Uh, they were working on, on two of the vessels, but of course, at the end of the night, they would bring them back up on alert because we had to have them up on alert at all times. <clears throat> and, however, uh, all ten of them went no-go or disabled. Uh, shut down while UFOs were observed by the crews at the sites. Uh, there's a picture of Walt Fiegel and so on. Uh, let's see if I can. Uh, oh, go back. I may have to go back here. Excuse me. with his permission and so he's uh, still alive and well and he's supported this case uh, he's never changed the story on this uh, this was Eric Carlson who was his commander at the time uh, in the capsule and he also talks about uh, supporting what Walt said uh, talked to Walt can't remember anything else uh, but uh, again he uh, letter says it or not, but he also uh, says I can use his name and uh, he's a real person. <laughs> so he's, he's still alive and well, living somewhere in Louisiana Bayou there. Uh, and then on March 24th, uh, like I said, 45 years ago, I was, I was this guy. Uh, on alert, my commander was taking a nap. We had a little cot down there. And uh, first thing I get a call from Topside Garden says, uh, uh, well, uh, uh, we're seeing some strange lights up here. They're flying very fast, uh, making uh, uh, odd maneuvers, stopping on a dime, reversing course, going up and down, and uh, they're not making any sounds. Uh, I kind of just kind of dismissed that. <laughs> Didn't know quite what to think of that. Uh, so I went back to my math book, hung up on him. <laughs> and, 
And then he calls back five minutes later, and this time he's screaming into the phone. He's uh, very scared. I can tell. Uh, very, very frightened. He, uh, he says, uh, sir, I'm, I'm looking out the front gate, and I see this glowing red object. It's just hovering there. It's uh, uh, glowing red. He's, it's a, it's hard, hard to make out any specific detail of the object. Uh, but it's just sitting there. He's got all the guards out there with their weapons drawn. Wanted me to tell him what to do next. Uh, I think I told him just make sure nothing comes inside the gate, please. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and then he hung up. Uh, one of the guards did get injured. He said one of the guards got injured. He hung up the phone. And so I went over to tell my commander about the phone calls. And uh, and just as I was about to tell him about this, and by the way, I'll, I'll mention this. Uh, you know, I'll, I just mentioned it. And you can make what you, you can of it. Right after I hung up the phone with that guard upstairs, I looked over at my board, and I felt, we're going to get shut down. Hmm. You know, this is just a feeling I had, I'll be honest with you. Uh, so I um, went over and talked to my commander, woke him up, and sure enough, uh, we get a lot of bells and whistles in the, in the capsule down there, and uh, the, the lights start turning from green to red. And I recall all 10 of the missiles going down. Fred Mywald, who you'll hear in just a moment, uh, uh, remembers that we lost between five and eight. And so uh, when I first started talking about this, I kind of deferred to what his memory was. Uh, let me just backtrack a little bit about memories on, on this. <laughs> uh, I was told never, ever to talk about this. And not only told, but I had to write, uh, I had to sign a document, and I did. I signed a document. Uh, uh, we got called in uh, to the squadron commander's office after this happened. There was a member of AFOSI there, and he basically just wanted, he didn't even want to hear the story, he wanted me to sign this document. And so I did, I signed it, uh, never to talk about it. And uh, any of you that have ever had access to classified information, you know, if you're not using it, the best thing to do is forget it, because you don't want to want it to slip out at some time. So that's what I tried to do. I tried to just forget this stuff and, uh, until I saw the book in 94. And then, and then it's a, it was a matter of trying to recover all these memories, so, which, which was a process. Uh, it was just a process because, well, we all had different experiences uh, between 67 and 94. I had all kinds of things happen to me. <laughs> and, uh, and, and these things just take up room up there. <laughs> anyway, so, Uh, again, we reported to the command post, uh, Fred Mywald, uh, who you're here in a minute, and, um, and then Fred turned to me and said, you know, the same thing happened at another flight. And I, I remember that specifically, uh, vividly, very vividly, and I, I'd always, re always remembered him saying that. And I, I always thought it was that night. So, well, again, when I first started talking about this, I talked about two flights going down the same same day, same night. Uh, but as it turns out, what he should have said was the same thing had happened a week earlier. Uh, so anyway, I go upstairs, confront the flight security controller, uh, and he assured me that uh, what he told me was true. Uh, there's no way he could have manufactured a story like that and then have the missiles go down right after that. Uh, I told you about the debriefing of my squadron commander an old World War II pilot, uh, and uh, he was white as a sheet, shaking his head. He didn't know what happened. It was not an Air Force exercise, for sure. Oh, let me go back here. This is Fred Mywald. Maybe five, ten minutes, maybe longer. Uh, they went all back. That's me. 
guy shot a real scare and said there was one just outside the front gate. And uh, they, they also said, I recall, that uh, one of the other guards had gotten injured in some way. I, I, don't, I don't think it was from the UFO. I think it was from uh, trying to climb the fence or something like that. <laughs> uh, and then I hung up, or he hung up because he had to go his guard got injured. And then, and then I believe you were either getting up or I woke you up. And then some of our missiles started setting down. Is that right? Is that about how you remember it? Right. We had the security alarms and uh, yeah. problems in a couple of the uh, sites. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, I'm sure glad I found you. <laughs> <laughs> now, that was 1995 when I contacted Fred Marwell. Um, uh, here's another recording. Again, Fred Marwell still alive. Well, Big reports from the field about UFOs. Some average and two guards had gone out to one of the sites. Uh, I got back scared to death. We had to release them with the engineer. Yeah. Oh, you mean uh, our guards? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, we're on the patrol tape. Oh, I see. They had gone out to one of the sites. shut down, we had uh, security alarms, so we had to send guards out there to check on a couple of the sites where the, we had security alarms, and uh, they saw the UFOs again, and uh, uh, like I said, it was very frightening for these guys to, to uh, confront them. Uh, this is, uh, I was mentioned that we did have a press conference uh, in 2010, September of 2010, where uh, a couple of the other witnesses came forward to, uh, to talk about this. Uh, here's one of them. This is Arnie Arneson. Good afternoon. My name is Dwayne Arneson. I'm going to give a, kind of an adjunct testimony to what Bob has already spoken about. After graduating from college with degrees in physics and math, I entered the Air Force, got a commission, and served 26 years as a communication electronics officer in positions all over the world, including Vietnam. <coughs> My highest clearance in hell was a top secret crypto special compartment information talent keyhole. For those that know clearances, you gotta be almost squeaky clean to get that. Back in 1967, I was officer in charge of the communications center at the 28th Air Division in Great Falls, Montana. I was also the crypto custodian. I was a top secret control officer for the division, and I passed out nuclear launch authenticators. In March of that particular year, I can clearly recall a message coming through my communications center, which basically said, what well, Bob has already talked about, that a UFO did in fact shut down several missile silos in Montana. Not being a missile type, I didn't know Oscar flight from Echo flight, so I couldn't relate to any of those details. But the fact was that a missile, missiles were shut down. The next witness is Captain Robert Jameson, and uh, it was his testimony that actually uh, nailed down the date uh, of my incident for us. Jameson, between January of 1965 and October of 1967, I was stationed at Moffstrom Air Force Base as a combat missile target and team commander. Our main job 
was to point the missiles in the right direction. Also, we may be dispatched from time to time to do a restart. In case any missile goes off alert, we have to restart it and verify the targeting data. In March 1967, I was on alert for dispatch. That evening, I got a call from John Control saying the missile going down and all the flight would go out and restart. Which was nothing unusual up to this point. I called my team and I went down to the, to the hangar. As soon as I got to the hangar, some acquaintances of mine approached me and said, Bob, you know what happened? No, I don't know what happened. And he says, well, a missile, a UFO, was sighted over Lewistown, Montana, actually over Roy, Montana, Lewistown's the nearest town of any significance. But over that Lewistown, Roy, Montana, which is the center of Oscar flight, and when that UFO, at the same time that UFO was over there, all of Oscar flight went down. Well, that was highly unusual. I went to job control to verify it, and yes, they confirmed it. And I looked at that, the status board they have. They have a you know, map, the whole wing. I know everything was green. All the lights, they have just lights for this side. All the lights were green except one corner, and the other right-hand corner was all red. All of Oscar flight was down. I mentioned to them that doesn't happen. He says, well, it happened once before, about a week before. A UFO was sighted over Echo Flight. About the same time, all missiles at Echo Flight went down. He says, other than that, this is it. It's never going to happen before. Personally, I'm never aware of any two missiles going down at the same time, let alone ten. Okay, this is one of the documents that we got from the Air Force. Uh, and I'll just uh, uh, emphasize a couple of passages here. All 10 missiles in Echo Flight at Malmstrom lost strategic alert within 10 seconds of each other. This incident occurred uh, on 845, I think, local, on 16 March. Uh, and then they said all missiles had been returned to strategic alert. So I, I just want to point out that even though the missiles were shut down, uh, they were not damaged, per se. Uh, what happened was... The indications we got were guidance and control system failure. We had something called uh, VERSA, I think it's called, uh, a voice reporting uh, status assembly, something like that, um, which kind of reads back what the problem is to us. So uh, uh, these were guidance, guidance cans that failed. Uh, the missiles, again, this was before GPS. <laughs> uh, the missiles had to be uh, targeted by shooting the stars, actually. So literally, they had to shoot stars and, and figure out, you know, accurately, very accurately, uh, how to target these missiles. So that took at least a day or so. Um, but this is an important passage here. The fact that no apparent reason for the loss of 10 missiles can be readily identified is cause for grave concern, grave concern, to this missile. At this headquarters, we must have an in-depth analysis to determine cause and corrective action. We must know as quickly as possible what the impact is to the fleet. So, headquarters, Strategic Air Command was in a hurry to find out this was a problem they didn't understand. This is a part of another document we got. This was part of the... Um, um, uh, it was a quarterly uh, status report of the wing. Uh, uh, history report, unit history is what they call it. Um, and this is the only reference to UFO in that document. Uh, rumors of UFO around the area of Echo Flight during the time of the fall were disproven. Well, they were disproven, so we're okay. Yeah. <laughs> but, now, how do you disprove uh, sighting, a uh, UFO sighting? Well, you know, if, if I were going to look into it, I'd probably interview uh, some of the people involved, like myself, or uh, maybe some of the guards, uh, things like that. Uh-uh. That never happened. Never happened. As uh, a matter of fact, uh, the fellow that wrote that report, uh, this is Airman David Gamble. We were able to contact him. He was the wing historian. And we asked him about this, how they uh, disproved the UFO sightings. He said, I don't know. I don't recall interviewing the mobile strike team or anyone in the radar squad. Um, what I do recall is there was a general reluctance 
a willingness to discuss the subject by anyone, uh, and that at times uh, is uh, superior would change the uh, you know the history as he wrote it. Uh, and and those these were the UFO sightings history. So there was a history of UFO sightings in these states, and some are all from. So those were the two times that he remembers that editing his reports. And then, uh, as a result of uh, carrying on some radio shows, uh, we got a hold of uh, Robert Kaminsky, who was head of the Boeing team that investigated the, the incidents. And he talks about, uh, you know, they did a very thorough study. They, they looked at all different factors. They looked at weather, lightning. They looked at power failures. They looked at computer failures, uh, uh, personnel failures, uh, personnel trying to compromise the computers or something and uh, they said we found nothing significant to explain what happened at Echo Flight. The team went off to do a report. <laughs> However, in the meantime, uh, his boss contacted him told him that the incident was reported as being a UFO event. Subsequently, a few days later, they were notified by the Air Force to stop any further effort on this project. We were not to submit a final engineering report. Uh, very unusual that the Air Force would on one hand say this is uh, something very critical, something important, we got to get to the bottom of it, and then on the next hand tell their investigative team uh, to not write any report on it. Uh, but I think I know why. <laughs> I think I know why, and it was this, the Condon study. Uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but the, uh, the Air Force had uh, set up and funded a, uh, a, a study on UFOs headed up by Edward Condon, and I think they signed this uh, agreement in, the, in August of 66. Well, in, in uh, March of 67, this investigation was going on, full blown. Uh, and, of course, the Air Force uh, the intent here was strictly to, to get out of the UFO business. The Air Force didn't really want to study this subject. They just wanted uh, to avoid having to uh, deal with it. And so this whole thing was a, a whitewash. Uh, the final, uh, uh, you know, I won't go into too much detail. I think a lot of you are familiar with the Condon report and study. Um, but uh, I will go into the, what I know or what I was able to uncover about the cover-up. Uh, USAF still uses, the course, the kind of report as the main reason to dismiss UFOs. Uh, Dr. Roy Craig was um, a member of the Condon Committee. He was actually the, uh, later on, after there was um, some problems uh, within the committee, uh, Craig took over as chief investigator. Uh, of course, he had no investigative experience at all. <laughs> I think he taught chemistry at the University of Colorado and, uh, <laughs> and knew nothing about field investigations. Uh, uh, but what happened was we had uh, uh, the county committee had made arrangements with uh, NICAP, which is the, uh, the UFO study group at the time, uh, uh, and, and uh, other UFO groups uh, like like MUFON, although I don't think MUFON was active at that time, uh, asking for input for the committee. In other words, uh, if you had a good case, uh, let us know about it. We'll, uh, we'll look into it. So as it turned out, uh, Ray Fowler had heard, uh, because Ray Fowler was working for Sylvania at the time, uh, he had heard about the, the missile shutdowns at Malmstrom. And uh, from his people, they were on, on site, uh, and the, in fact, one of his one of his people had actually seen the object, uh, and so he notified uh, Dr. Roy Craig about this, uh, invited him over to his home, and gave him all the details. Uh, Craig was very interested, uh, took this information. He visited Malmstrom uh, in October of 1967, um, but was told uh, by Colonel Chase that. They couldn't talk about it. Uh, 
there was an ongoing investigation, blah, 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 but they were going to write a report. Uh, the report, of course, would be classified. <laughs> and by the way, there was only one person on the Conning Committee that could review classified documents, and that was Robert Blow, Bob Blow. And Bob Lowe had already uh, blown off the UFO thing uh, even before the investigations uh, by Cotton had started. But um, uh, so uh, Cotton just, uh, I mean, Craig just turned around and went home, I guess. He never, he never, uh, to my knowledge, uh, talked to anybody uh, who was witness to the Echo or Oscar incident. Uh, about it. So again, in 1966, Representative Gerald Ford from Michigan, uh, due to the Michigan sightings, uh, asked for a congressional hearing uh, with the Air Force, and, and then as a result of that, the Air Force decided to award a UFO study in August of 66 to Edward Condon, who, by the way, in 1944, was a member of the Manhattan Project. Uh, and in 1946, FBI uh, well, he was he was booted off the Manhattan Project uh, for some reason I don't know why. But in '46, FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover accused Condon of being uh, in writing, by the way, of being a Soviet espionage agent. I got that letter, <laughs> and uh, so you got to wonder why uh, the Air Force picked Condon to do this investigation. So again, we'll, we'll go through this real quick. I've got more, much more details on my website, which I'll, I'll point to here in a minute. March uh, 67, missiles shut down at Maelstrom. Uh, March 24th, this uh, UFO report uh, at Belt, Montana, uh, this was a truck driver, and again, this was the same day as my uh, the Oscar shutdown. This was a truck driver driving through Belt, Montana. He's he was driving his rig and sees the UFO uh, trailing him, uh, not trailing him, but just to the side of him, going about the same speed. <laughs> he looks over, does a double take, and then uh, and then stops his truck, and uh, the UFO stops and uh, goes into a gully. And this was all written up on Blue Book by the way. Um, uh, the truck driver calls the Montana Highway Patrol. A patrolman comes out and actually sees the object down there sitting uh, at the bottom of a gully. Uh, they contact the Air Force uh, at Malmstrom. The Air Force gets involved. Uh, it's too late to send out helicopters to look at this thing. So they wait until the morning, but by then the UFO had gone. Uh, but this was a very well documented sighting, and uh, and this is the uh, what what Jameson had recalled uh, hearing about on that night, March 24th. Uh, Colonel Chase, of course, kept in touch with Condon all the time on this. Um, uh, and by the way, Colonel Chase had had his own uh, significant UFO sighting in 1957. Uh, uh, Maybe I'll go through that very briefly. Um, in June of 67, Conning calls uh, Air Force base UFO officers. By this time, uh, many of uh, Air Force bases in the United States had assigned UFO officers. Literally, that was his title. He was a UFO officer at Malmstrom Air Force Base. And, uh, anyway, they come up with a meeting, and uh, Chase actually writes in his uh, uh, memos to the effect that uh, that was a good meeting, but they never talked about any of the interesting cases, uh, only the cases that were could be easily dismissed. Uh, they never talked about that, three, four, five percent. And in fact, Lieutenant Colonel Chase sends a letter to uh, uh, Foreign Technology Division, Wright Patterson Air Force Base uh, UFO office. That's what it was called in 1967, FTD UFO office. <laughs> uh, they had inquired about the Maelstrom cases, wanted to know if there was any damage or effect on equipment, and Chase wrote back and said, no, uh, obviously lying about it. Uh, 
I'd like to tell you about one of my heroes. Uh, uh, yesterday, I was down there in Tucson uh, reviewing the case files that uh, Dr. James McDonald, uh, he was a professor at the University of Arizona. Uh, he was a meteorologist, I guess, scientist. But he was also a very uh, consummate, avid uh, UFO investigator. Uh, there's 50 some boxes of his uh, papers down there at the uh, Special Collections Library at the University of Arizona. I would highly recommend if any of you are uh, interested uh, uh, to go down there and take a look at some of the things he's got because he's got a, a treasure trove of information. Uh, I only got through a, <laughs> uh, you know, about six boxes of it. Uh, but. Uh, in there, uh, he does mention the Malfoy case. He knew about it. Uh, he, he had talked to Ray Fowler about it. Matter of fact, McDonald uh, uh, talked to uh, and knew um, some of the biggies in the industry in, in this field, uh, Heineck uh, uh, and, and a lot of other people that he had worked with. Uh, he interviewed Colonel Chase. He has some uh, audio, audio recording of his interview. Uh, in one of the files. And by the way, as a result of this Colonel Chase incident, uh, we discovered that, in fact, the Air Force had classified files uh, uh, under Blue Book. Uh, supposedly, all their files, uh, UFO files, were under Blue Book, but um, they forgot to mention to the Cotton Committee that they had classified files. And one of the classified files was uh, Colonel Chase's incident. Uh, anyway, uh, just want to send out kudos. Uh, of course, he's deceased now, but uh, uh, he was a great investigator. So in 67, Condon uh, investigator Roy Craig goes out there. And by the way, I've got his notes. Uh, Roy Craig. Uh, uh, we got copies of his notes um, while he was at Maelstrom. Uh, anyway, he learned about the uh, UFO uh, shutdowns uh, at Maelstrom uh, from Ray Fowler. He goes out there in October. He visits Maelstrom to look into the, this, and Chase tells him, well, Chase, Chase him, chases him away. He says, <laughs> <laughs> so, no UFO is associated with this. You can go home. So uh, he did. Uh, Con Committee drops the UFO missile investigation. Uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, they, they complete uh, the report in January of 1969, uh, stating no further need to investigate, and the Air Force officially stops UFO investigation record keeping in uh, December of 1969. If you want more details about this whole cover up that was going on, uh, because I think that it's very much related to what happened at Malmstrom. If the Connick Committee had investigated that, it would have blown the whole issue wide open. Uh, so I do think that that was a, a key. And, and you can go to my website, you'll see a lot more details about that. It's uh, spiralgalaxy.org. And this is what the Air Force said. I think a lot of you have seen this uh, as a result of um, uh, no UFO reported, investigated, and evaluated by the Air Force was ever an indication of threat to our national security. Well, you could argue, you know, losing 10 or 20 nuclear missiles within the span of a week to UFOs might be considered a national security item. <laughs> Uh, other incidents I'll talk about real quick. Uh, Beale Air Force Base, uh, California, 1959. Beale Air Force Base was the home of uh, 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 some B-52s. Uh, obviously, uh, nuclear aircraft had nuclear weapons. And uh, I've got a, a witness, a very strong witness, saying that uh, they were chasing UFOs out of that area all the time there uh, in 1959. Bad Air. Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. This is uh, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, Robert. Um, anyway, he was a, a 
videographer who took uh, pictures of uh, uh, the flight of uh, Atlas missile with a dummy warhead. And uh, when they developed the video, they saw a UFO flying circles around the warhead. Uh, of course, the warhead's going 10, 15,000 miles per hour. But this UFO is flying circles around it, shooting a beam of a light right at the warhead. Uh, he and uh, his immediate boss, Major Mansman, have supported this story. Uh, and, uh, and he hasn't changed his story since. So uh, it, uh, the video was obviously confiscated by the CIA. That's what he, he said it was during the meeting. Uh, CIA uh, clipped off the video and took it with him. Ellsworth Air Force Base, South Dakota, 1976. Um, another witness, similar to my case, uh, he's a, a capsule commander, underground missile. This is Minuteman again. UFO flies over, uh, causes a lot of disruption in the uh, in, on his board. Uh, he is actually has some missing time. Um, he was. He was taken after that, put in the hospital for two months, even though he wasn't sick, uh, by the Air Force. Uh, uh, he was drugged, interrogated, sent home for three months, uh, came back, and they had a little black box monitoring him, uh, I don't know, for a long time. Uh, there's some shenanigans going on with that one. I'm, I'm, I'm writing this into a book I'm writing right now, my next book, called Unidentified. I uh, hope to have that up before the, too long. Uh, Whiteman Air Force Base, Missouri, 1976. Again, another missile base um, uh, seen by multiple witnesses, uh, many, many witnesses on base uh, hovering over uh, Alpha-1, which is near the front gate of Whiteman, um, shoots a beam of light down Alpha-1 and flies off. Aviano Air Base, Italy, 1979, same kind of thing. Uh, UFO comes to the base uh, where the nuclear weapons are stored. This is a NATO base. They have nuclear weapons there uh, stored in the weapons, um, let's see, weapons storage area. Shines a beam of light down at the weapons storage area and flies off. Sosterberg Air Base, Netherlands, 1979. Uh, young, young lady sees a UFO uh, right next to the base. Uh, this was uh, an American uh, facility, even though it's a, a Netherlands Air Base, but they had an American unit there, a U.S. unit. And again, nuclear weapons were stored there. And this, uh, this story, by the way, uh, uh, was written up in the paper, and it's also well documented. All these, uh, uh, what I'm mentioning now, are well documented cases. Bent waters, uh, and this is another one where, uh, and I've been in contact with Colonel Holt, who was there uh, during this incident. And he, uh, even though he won't admit it publicly, but he assured me personally that they did have nuclear weapons there, and uh, and. Uh, Again, uh, at one point he did see, the, uh, not him, but uh, one of the people he was with did see a beam of light being shown down on the weapons storage area. Uh, one a little bit newer, Francis E. Warren Air Force Base, Wyoming, uh, right near the Nebraska border. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember this one. Uh, this was 2010. Uh, they lost 50, 50. ICBMs uh, one shot. Uh, they claim officially that it was a computer glitch, but we have got witnesses. Uh, witnesses have been, have been coming forward saying that they, they too saw UFOs uh, overhead when this happened. Uh, this is uh, a statement by Major Bradford Runyon. Some of you have heard about this. This is Minot Air Force Base. 1968, uh, this is North Dakota. He was flying a B-52. Uh, the uh, uh, ground control told him that there was a bright object they wanted him to uh, take a look at in the area. So they were 
the vectored into the bright object. Uh, the object approached his aircraft at high speed and then made a dead stop off the tail. Uh, they lost radio contact with the base at that point. Uh, after about 10 minutes of uh, this, uh, he decided to land his aircraft. The object was still on his tail 10 miles from the base. And during the debriefing, uh, he said that he was told that a 20-ton concrete steel, steel lid had been removed from the missile silo. That, that was that lid I showed you earlier over the launch facility. And uh, here's a statement on the left uh, in his own hand. And this you probably have never heard of. Camp Slayer, Iraq, 2006. 25 uh, U.S. soldiers were on patrol in the town of Makassi, south of Baghdad Airport. Platoon sergeant was David Koch, not a member of the Koch brothers. Uh, and here's one part of his statement. You could not see the stars. Uh, this, they stopped the patrol. They were told to look up. And uh, he said you could not see the stars between the lights. There were these bright lights uh, at the tips or the points of a triangle, a huge triangle. It was triangular in shape with each side of the right uh, triangle uh, equal in length. It had lights on only the leading edge of the shape in the shape of a V. The lights were colored white, orange, no rivets, no seams, no exhaust ports, no sound, moving very slowly. The edge length was about three football fields, he said. Uh, I show this picture because this is a lot like what he was talking about. This was uh, obviously an a image made by Larry Lowe, who's not here, I guess. I didn't ask him permission. I hope he doesn't mind. This. <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, this was Phoenix Lights. Uh, what you know, he had uh, how he had depicted the Phoenix Lights. But this, uh, the reason I bring this up is because on the way down here, I got a call from uh, David. We keep in touch uh, because he's been trying to get uh, others from his platoon to come forward. And uh, he was pretty excited because he did finally get another guy to uh, come forward. He's actually still on active duty. I haven't talked to him yet, but he's, uh, he's agreed to go public with this. Uh, so this is another significant case that you'll hear more about. Uh, some conclusions. Um, no valid cause for shutdowns was ever determined. Um, we have shown through eyewitness accounts, and uh, I'm going to talk about my case now, uh, and, and documents that intelligently controlled objects of unknown origin demonstrating control over our most advanced weapons. One thing uh, I would like to mention, uh, I've got another report which I didn't put up here because he didn't want to, he doesn't want to go uh, public, but I can guarantee you this guy's for real. He would, uh, we found his, his name and, uh, and we know he did what he, he said he did. Uh, uh, we have records uh, from Nelson Air Force Base that show him there doing what he claims he did. Anyway, uh, he was one of the, uh, uh, one of the officers that uh, brought uh, Echo Flight back up on alert. So he was out at one of the sites uh, the next day, and uh, he went down that little ladder into that bay, the maintenance bay, and he was working on uh, bringing the, going through his checklist and bringing the missile back up on alert. Uh, when the guard upstairs <coughs> shakes the ladder, <laughs> and motions him to come up. And so he, he climbs up the ladder, and sure enough, there's this orange orb just hovering right above. Uh, guards shaking, he's scared to death. Uh, this man, uh, for some reason, and uh, this was after I pointed out to him uh, uh, why, why he did this, but for some reason, he he acknowledged that the object was there, 
but he said he had to finish his job. So he went back down the ladder and started going through his checklist. Well, he would get to a certain point in his checklist and the missile would shut down again. Uh, so he tried again. He, and then he'd go through his checklist. He'd get to a certain point, missile would shut down again. <coughs> this object was still up there. He went through this many, many times, he said. And uh, it, he had the uh, distinct sense that this object knew exactly how our systems worked. And in detail, in great detail. As a matter of fact, he told me he felt that there was a kind of a rope of, of electromagnetic energy coming down the tube. It was like a rope, he said. <laughs> coming down the tube that was right next to him as he was going through his uh, procedures. Uh, so, and again, in, in my case, and in the ECHO case, um, we had very specific failure mode for these missiles. It was guidance and control system failure throughout. Nothing else. Uh, this was not a power failure, not, none of that. Uh, it was just guidance and control system failure. And. And these missiles are independent. Uh, they are not interconnected uh, when you connect uh, Christmas tree lights. So if there was a specific problem in one missile, it would not affect another missile. But they all shut down for the same reason. So the rationale being uh, they would have had to have sent a specific signal through what we call our SIN lines, sensitive information network lines. But these lines were uh, triply shielded, triply shielded against EMI, uh, electromagnetic interference. And they were 60 feet underground. So think about that. And when people say that, oh, this could have been some Air Force project, some aircraft they should have made at the time. <laughs> but they would have had to penetrate 60 feet of earth and concrete and then penetrate these cables that were triply shielded and inject a specific signal in order to shut these down uh, in the way they did. So clearly um, this was a highly advanced intelligence uh, that, knew, that knows our systems in great detail. I think the public has a need to know all this. Uh, the U.S. Air Force and people above them are lying to the public about the reality of UFOs. So I think uh, as far from the standpoint of was this some kind of a message, uh, I think it was. Uh, I think uh, because they didn't do any damage per se, I think this was some kind of a message, and the message being eliminate your nuclear weapons. And by the way, you might want to think about alternate ways to produce energy other than nuclear. Uh, this is a picture of Nagasaki, Japan, 1945, before the bomb hit. And this is about, I'd say, I don't know, 10 square miles, something like that. This is a picture of Nagasaki after the bomb hit. Take a good look. All those buildings down there were populated with people. Now, I'm not going to argue whether or not it was right to do this. Uh, I mean, everybody's got their own opinion. I, I, I'm not even sure what my opinion is, but uh, I just wanted to, to show the, the kind of destruction we're talking about. This was done by a 15 kiloton weapon, 15 kilotons. The weapons we had uh, in 1967 were at least 300 kilotons, 20 times what you saw of the damage there. Uh, this was a nuclear arms race um, around 1967. You'll see here, it's about 1967, right? Mm -hmm. We had the peak stockpile, over 30,000. This is U.S. stockpile. Worldwide, including the Russians, we had close to 70,000 nuclear bombs uh, in 1967. 
70,000. It's beginning to trail off now. Uh, now we're down to, I think, 2,100 uh, is the latest information I've got. Uh, our capability for destruction, uh, again, worldwide, we've got something like, there's something like 10,000 nuclear weapons that are ready to launch right now. The destructive power of each is anywhere from 300 kilotons to 1.5 megatons. That's millions of tons of TNT. Uh, oh, approximately 20,000, I'm sorry. Uh, this is an old slide. Uh, today, there are enough weapons-grade nuclear material in the world. By the way, uh, these uh, power plants, these nuclear power plants, uh, produce weapons-grade plutonium as a result of producing power. And um, so uh, in the world now, there's, 100, uh, there's enough material to build 120,000 nuclear bombs and more on the way uh, as we continue to produce nuclear power all over the world. The United States is the only nuclear weapons state to deploy its nuclear weapons uh, 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 overseas. So we have weapons deployed uh, still, I think, overseas. I know we brought them back from England, uh, supposedly. Uh, 200 nuclear bombs at six air bases in five NATO countries, Belgium, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, and Turkey. This is from the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Today there's enough weapons-grade material to build uh, more than 120,000 nuclear weapons. But on the, on the positive side, we have signed a new START treaty with Russia, and this is intended to start the reduction of of, of nuclear down to zero, hopefully sometime in the future. Uh, but in order to do that, of course, we have to get, make sure we have proper inspection techniques where we, uh, and, and by the way, this treaty allows for us to share uh, information, satellite information, intelligence information about each other's nuclear capabilities. So this, this is a good sign. And it was passed by the Senate of the United States, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> uh, so right now we've got nine nuclear powers. You could probably name them. Uh, two of them, Pakistan, well, Pakistan is one, of course, uh, unstable government. Iran, uh, and again, this is just my opinion. Uh, I. Uh, you know, they're, they're saying that they, they, they don't want nuclear weapons, but in fact, they know full well that if they have a high-speed, um, uh, uh, what do you call them? Uh, centrifuges. Centrifuges, yeah. Because uh, that, that's how uranium is enriched with centrifuges. They turn into a gas or a liquid, I think, and, and they spin it around very high speeds and uh, enrich the uranium cotton, U-238 content. Uh, no, sorry, U-235 content of uranium. They know full well that they can have weapons-grade uranium. Uh, and it's just uh, another step from that to building the bomb. So uh, I think we're fooling ourselves, even uh, uh, thinking that we can stop any country, really, from having nuclear weapons capability. Um, uh, Syria would be another possibility. North Korea, we're, we're in conference with North Korea now on, on how to uh, get rid of their uh, nuclear program. But uh, this is a situation which is still very critical. We should all be concerned about it. The other situation we could, should be concerned about is excessive secrecy in government. Uh, this is... Uh, a, a graph of the number of uh, uh, what's called derivative classification activity. 
It starts in 1996 down here and goes through about present day. But you see the, the number of documents that uh, continue to build up that are, that are classified. Um, some of these uh, documents uh, have to do with um, how agencies interpret uh, uh, what they have to do uh, and what they have to classify and, and how they're supposed to handle it. And, and a lot of this stuff, uh, especially with intelligence agencies, uh, is not open for discussion. Uh, we don't have a, a way of checking on, on what they're doing, a good way. Uh, there has been attempts, there have been attempts to try and reduce this uh, mass of intelligence information or classification information. Uh, but they continue to grow um, despite the attempts. Yeah, we need disclosure. Uh, I'm disclosing right now. This is disclosure. When someone like myself gets up and talks about it, I'm disclosing. Uh, but what we're talking about really is um, what does the government know and what does this secret group, which I'll call the cabal, uh, that is controlling this information uh, about the phenomenon. Uh, what do they know? What do they have? And um, uh, because they're say, they're taking some actions uh, regarding this phenomenon without our uh, input, without our say, without our knowledge. Uh, actions that could affect um, all of humanity, obviously. So continued secret operations with the government corrupts the whole democratic process. Again, we tried uh, in, 20, in 2010 to uh, bring six military witnesses together and uh, gave a press conference. We did get a lot of press from it. Uh, matter of fact, uh, if I had been flying on an airplane back from Washington, D.C. That, that evening, I would have been on Good Morning America the next day. Uh, <laughs> But uh, when my wife got that call, I was in the air. So, uh, but we did get uh, coverage, uh, live coverage on CNN uh, and uh, many other uh, publications. And again, you can go to my website and see uh, those other six, six witnesses talking about uh, their testimony. And all these testimonies, by the way, all of their testimonies, they have signed affidavits. Uh, legal affidavits affirming what uh, what they talked about. So I'll just go ahead and summarize real quick. Uh, uh, like I said, the nuclear issue is still front and center. Uh, I think we got a warning from ET. And by the way, I'm ET hypothesis advocate. <laughs> we did get a warning from ET that uh, get rid of these things. Uh, they're not good for your health. Uh, the UFO phenomenon is real, and me, even though the media still ignores and ridicules it, uh, it'll not go away because uh, the majority of the public still believe it is real. Uh, whoops. Uh, the excess secrecy in government will continue to worsen, and I think um, the public will demand change, and I think that that will have an effect ultimately. Uh, and of course, we need to point the finger at the fact that there is a highly secretive cabal holding these secrets and allowed to operate independently and um, basically from ET's perspective the whole of humanity is uh, complicit in whatever they do. So that's my talk. Thank you. I have not been able to contact any of the guards. Uh, the, again, going back to the report by the main guard, uh, because I quizzed him, uh, I've just had a brief moment to quiz him because they had actually sent out a helicopter to get us and fly us back. Uh, uh, he said he had a hard time seeing anything distinctive about this object. So, no, I don't think he saw beings in the craft, yeah. Yes? 
Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, one of the people you admired was uh, Dr. McDonald at UMA, yes. mm -hmm. uh, and that he had passed on. I don't know if you're familiar with the gentleman. His name is Larry Class. He was a uh, writer for uh, Cedar editor and writer for uh, Aviation Week. Uh, as an engineer by profession, he made mention of the work of Dr. Uh, uh, McDonald specifically uh, with your project. According to class, uh, last heard McDonald, after he shut down his UFO investigation, uh, he committed suicide. Do you have any reason to believe it was accelerated? <coughs> And this is just speculation on my part, but uh, I have my doubts that he committed suicide. Now, having said that, um, I can tell you um, that his um, uh, his widow um, does think he committed suicide. So, um, uh, it's 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 hard to say. It's just um, difficult for me to believe that. Uh, a man of his intelligence and commitment to this subject uh, would get so depressed, but uh, he did have bouts of depression. That's a fact. I think he, he had one attempt at suicide, uh, but that's a question I don't think anybody can answer right now. Yeah. Is this the one where he fell out of a window? No, no. Uh, he was found somewhere out in the desert uh, with a bullet or in his head and a gun next to him. Yes. I wonder if you could share your personal struggles with uh, your security oath and whether or not to disclose and the non-disclosure statement that you signed. And specifically, when you, you said earlier you were prompted to disclose after learning about what you thought was your incident and you thought it might alleviate some of the restriction and then you found out it was the echo flight incident did that put you at risk and how did you struggle with that yeah i did have an aw shit moment <laughs> <laughs> yeah well i uh, you know i was a i was a career officer uh when the incident occurred, I signed that document. I, I took that very seriously, of course. Uh, I didn't know why I had to sign that because I always, already had above top secret clearance, uh, you know, being a missile launch officer. So uh, I think uh, when I read that uh, paragraph in uh, above top secret, it was it was a real exciting moment for me because I had had this incident, I knew I'd had this incident, and I knew I couldn't talk about it. I never talked to anybody about it, honestly, um, up to that time. And so I guess I got overly excited, and uh, when the Air Force wrote back and, and said, we've got to declassify this incident, and I thought it was mine, I, I started talking right away. <laughs> <laughs> because I thought, Hey, it's declassified. Uh, I'm relieved of responsibility to keep this a secret. Now, when I found out it was the uh, Echo instead of Oscar, and I wasn't an Echo, um, I, I was very nervous about it. But by that time, I had already been on television. I had been on the radio talking about this. So I, I did make a conscious decision to keep talking. and. Uh, to this day, I have never been approached by any agent of the government saying you can't talk about this. Yeah. Bob, what does it take to actually take a missile silo offline? I know we just go over there and unplug it out of the wall. Well, like I said, this was guidance and control system failure, which means that the, the guidance package, the package that uh, directs the missile to the target, was misaligned, let's say, or, or the, uh, the guidance system was screwy so that it, it didn't know where to go. You know, if the missile was launched, it wouldn't know exactly where to go. So that's all it took, really, to shut the missile down. So this is a very uh, sensitive... So all the power didn't shut down? No, we didn't have any power loss. No power loss. The guidance system. The guidance system on the missiles went offline, yeah.
Are we here? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. You, uh, you mentioned something that was, I consider kind of important, that after you got the call from up above that there was a UFO, you said, and this was kind of an aside, that you suddenly knew that you were going to get shut down. Is that true? Yes. Okay. Now, to connect that with the fellow who went down inside and was working and the guard who's working on resetting the uh, guidance and mm -hmm. the guard said there's something up here and he went back down and went back to work. Mm -hmm. He described, or I was quite sure I heard, he described uh, like a cord of energy. Yes. Okay. Do you see a connection between your knowing? Now, how could you have known? It's not at all logical that there was any way to shut down mm -hmm. any of the missiles. As you said, even one or two, two at a time would be unusual, right? That, absolutely. Uh, I was there on alert for three years. Uh, I think I may have had one incident where a missile went down for no reason. Right, and there's two, a total of 20 missiles probably that went down over mm -hmm. a two-week period. Okay. Right. How do you connect your knowing? And I don't doubt you would have never said that had you not known. But in a sense, you're seeing the future like that. You knew something, and this other fellow felt the inflow of information as a cord of energy. Right. Okay. How do you, I mean, what comes to mind when you, when that comes up for you? Well, in, in my case, um, and, and I, had, I have only recently talked about this, but, uh, but I felt I was communicated with by them, uh, you know, telepathically. And they told me they were going to shut me down. Uh, you know, I, I I distinctly remember after the guard after I hung up with the uh, on the second call with the guard uh, pausing to try to you know absorb what was going on because it could have been some kind of a terrorist attack. Right. Right. And I thought about that, but then I remember specifically turning to the board. And thinking, I'm going to get shut down. And, and, yet, and I can't, I can't explain it other than that. Right. And yet, physically, in 1967, when that happened, that was an impossibility. There was no way to shut down that. that no energy. way. There was no way anybody could have shut those missiles down. The okay. Way, so the whatever way shut did. those down. No human way. Was well. No human. That we know of, but whatever shut those down had some other type of technique or technology something we don't understand that's why I, I claim that this this was uh, uh, something out of this world uh, I mean we we had no and uh, you know I, I I was pretty in the know about what kind of technology we had at the time you know we, we studied these systems pretty thoroughly and uh, I knew how they operated and and the latest technology. Uh, and I concluded this had to be not of this world. Yes? In regards to the technology, I'm trying to get this in the right perspective. Uh, 1967, was this vacuum tube technology on the guidance system? or was it? Well, I don't know about the guidance system. I know we had some vacuum tubes in the, in the capsule because they were, things had to be air-cooled. But, but I mean, in the, you don't know about the guidance system. Is that a vacuum? Yeah, I, I just don't know those details on the guidance system. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, in regards like, to his question, you thought maybe this is a terrorist attack, but then you thought, I'm going to get shut down. Did you also feel that you didn't have to worry that it's okay? Did you get that kind of feeling also? That I never got that feeling. <laughs> <laughs> this is not okay. <laughs> uh, yes. I don't know. I, I find it pretty reassuring that they can do that, if they can do it, they can do everyone in the world. And it'd be nice if they could levitate them right the hell out of here. <laughs> but my question is, and I've been coming around quite a bit here, and I've never heard it asked, is why they have the lights on these things. They What's don't that? need headlights. Why do they have their lights turned on at night? 
Are the UFOs? UFOs. Why do they have their lights on? Yeah, why? So we can see. Well, it's, uh, it's required by state law. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, a, a gentleman asked me that about the uh, Soviet Union. Yeah, there was a case in 1982. Um, I can't remember the name of the site. It's in Russian. But, uh, where the, a UFO comes over, um, a nuclear missile or ICBM, actually starts it on its launch sequence. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. So they see this thing. <laughs> starting on its launch sequence and uh, wow. Wow. but it, they were able to shut it down or, or the UFO shut it down I don't remember those details but th this was an ABC report by George Knapp I think Knapp actually was the investigative reporter for ABC you could probably you could probably get that uh, Google uh, Google that yeah yeah yes yeah. Uh, this is obviously very important part of your life, a very crucial segment of your life, this experience. Have you had any other experiences that you can think of in childhood, something weird, weird dreams, uh, since want? or after, or does this fit someplace within your life, this experience that you had? Well, mm. <laughs> yeah, I have had another experience. <laughs> um, I don't know if this is the right time to bring it up. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, 1985. I was um, I was living in Manhattan Beach with my wife, two children, and um, this is all I know about this. Okay, so don't ask me anymore because I don't know anymore. <laughs> uh, so in the middle of the night, um, I wake up, and in the living room there's a blue light, and it's more like a haze. It's more like a fog, blue light filtering in from the living room, which kind of scared the heck out of me. Uh, we had, you know, because uh, I thought we might have, you know, somebody might have broken in the house. And uh, by the way, this was after I got out of the Air Force and I hadn't talked about my incident. And, uh, I woke my wife up and uh, she saw also saw the blue light. And uh, after that, uh, she became unconscious. I became paralyzed. Um, don't remember much more than that, other than it scared the heck out of me. And, uh, that's about all I know. Did you have any missing time? Did you notice it was tuned? That's about all I know, sir. I, you know, again, uh, this is just, you know, I've never really talked about this. Uh, but uh, I, it's going to be in my book. I'm, I'm going to I'm going to write <laughs> I'm going to uh, write more about it, uh, in, and it'll be in my book. Yes. Uh, from your descriptions, apparently uh, several of the guards were very scared. Um, do you have any theories as to why that might have been? Why there was such uh, fear factor with, with the guards? Yeah, was. this is very frightening. Uh, matter of fact. Uh, I got a call from the, uh, a couple of the guards uh, kept uh, calling me the next day and wanted me to come talk to them about it because uh, you know, they, they were still dealing with the trauma of it. Now, if you can imagine, you know, uh, an orange or oval-shaped object just sitting there, um, you don't know what it is, and uh, you're, you're thinking all kinds of things. Uh, this shook them up. It really shook them up. Uh, they wanted to talk about it. I had to tell them I couldn't talk about it. By then, I had signed a non-disclosure statement, uh, uh, and I just said I, I can't can't talk about it with you. And that just it kills me to this day. You know that I was not able to at least sit down with them over a beer and just discuss this whole thing. <laughs> but uh, I couldn't do it. Yep. I guess I. I and what the gentleman said a few moments ago about how he wishes they could just levitate all of the uh, missiles off the planet. In your opinion, 
if they had the power to shut them down, why did, why did they let them come back on? Why didn't they just shut them down? If they're worried about well, nuclear... Uh, like I, like I mentioned, there have been many other incidents besides mine. Uh, and again, they're simply coming over, either shining a light on the weapons storage area, just to point our attention to that again. So uh, again, I think this is all, all these incidents involving UFO, uh, UFOs and nuclear weapons has to do with a message. They're trying to tell us something. I think is you know to give so, them so good warnings. They would have the power to go ahead and shut or mess up the guidance systems, but they're leaving it up to us to make the final decision. I think they want us to make the final decision to actually get this done. You know, get rid of these damn things, get it done. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, in your opinion, which elements of the U.S. government know about this, and uh, uh, how many people are, are involved? Huh. Yeah. Good question. I'm, I'm pretty sure the CIA knows about it. Um, the CIA has been mentioned many times. When you, when you um, say the CIA, you know the CIA is a very disparate organization. Yes. So oh, you're talking about individuals in the CIA? Sure. <laughs> I have no idea. Yes. If, uh, if the missiles were offline, if we hadn't had a power loss, theoretically, could they still have been launched? If they were launched, would they not know where to go? Would they implode in the silo itself, or was that ever? No, they couldn't have been launched. We couldn't have armed those missiles. Um, uh, it's a safeguard, you know. Uh, you don't want to launch a missile when it doesn't know where it's going. It might go to New York City instead of <laughs> Moscow, you know. <laughs> yes. How long? Or they were able to restart these missiles and get these missiles back online? I'd say uh, within a day, day and a half, maybe. Like I said, they, they had to go out there and go through um, an alignment procedure, <laughs> missile alignment, gotcha. uh, and uh, that took, took some time. Yeah. Yep. Uh, late 60s, I followed the guard at a Nike Thor missile base in mm -hmm. Oxford, Ohio. Mm -hmm. And he described a, a similar incident, which you've been talking about. Are you familiar at all, or have you ever heard of that particular incident? No. Uh, I will recommend a book called uh, UFOs and Nukes by Robert Hastings. Mm -hmm. And he's got a lot of information about <coughs> UFOs over many different nuclear sites and uh, uh, nuclear power generating plants. Uh, he's got uh, stories about uh, UFOs being seen over the Hanford facility, Hanford, uh, Washington, which uh, manufactured plutonium for the first uh, nuclear bombs. And uh, um, so he may have that kind of information in there. Uh, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So can you share with the, how the guidance system works? Because you mentioned that they had to physically go in there. So is it was it done electronically or was it done physically or a combination of both? That uh... you know, I just don't know those details. I didn't I didn't work in that area. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I was wondering, in alignment with what you were just saying about the power plant, do you know if there were any uh, any UFOs observed in over Japan for this most recent power? you know, leakage of that meltdown of, I can't pronounce the name of the power plant. Fukushima. Fukushima. I just, you know, from the internet, there's, there were, there seems to be a, have been some reports, but, you know, who can verify that? I, hard to say. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. uh, when the incident happened, was there like a buzz going around at the base where people were talking about the UFO? Or when we when we returned to the base that morning, I remember there was a buzz. There were, you know, uh, guys talking about it. Uh, but we were ordered to the squadron commander's office right away. Uh, he was white as a sheet, um, and the guy from AFOSI, Air Force Office of Special Investigation, was there. And uh, basically shoved some papers in our face and said, sign these now. Uh, from then on, uh, he ordered us never to talk about it to anybody. And this was now classified. Uh, 
Um, and so, again, there was no buzz after that. <laughs> Nobody talked about it. We didn't get debriefed on the incidents at all. And we got briefings every morning before we went on alert. We got briefings about what was going on, uh, all kinds of technical details. And uh, this was never brief, uh, debriefed uh, uh, in the next two years that I was there. Yes, sir. Why do you think, Robert, uh, that when you were asked to sign this, uh, what, what did you call this? A uh, non-disclosure statement. Non-disclosure, mm -hmm. that it included the people on the base itself. I mean, it's not like you're talking outside, you're going to the media or anything like that. Why did they uh, say you couldn't even talk to your fellow people well, out at the base? Yeah, Why well, like I mentioned, uh, at this time, un unbeknownst to me, the Condon Committee was in full investigation mode. They were given authority to talk to anybody in the Air Force about UFO incidents. If they had come to me, uh, I couldn't have talked to them. I couldn't have said anything because I was under this non-disclosure statement. That doesn't quite get at my question, though. Why did they pro pro prohibit you or anybody else talking to anybody else on the base, like you said, the two guys who were guards, whatever, tried to uh, make contact with you and they said they wanted to talk about it and you said you couldn't talk with them about it because you would signed this thing. Why do you think they poke it? Uh, they wanted to shut the whole thing down. They, they didn't want anybody to talk about it uh, because the more people that know about it, uh, the chances are it's going to leak out. As simple as that. They just uh, they shut the whole thing down as, as much as they could. Okay. Yeah. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. uh, regarding the declassification process, when a case is declassified, such as yours or the Echo Flight incident, does that mean previously classified documents are now available to be retrieved through the Freedom of Information Act? Does it mean that there's any obligation, if FOI is used, to release radar information from bases in the area or? Uh, radar. Well, any of you that have ever submitted an FOI request, uh, what they'll tell you is you have to be specific. You have to tell them exactly what you're looking for, and they'll go look for it, and they'll let you know if they can release it. So, Has anybody looked for radar uh, confirmation of any of the objects? Well, uh, my investigator, James Klotz, it, by the way, is an outstanding investigator. Um, and I'm sure he, he requested a lot of information. And uh, after I started talking about it, and after we, I went public, um, uh, the information dried up, I can tell you that. Uh, we wouldn't get much of a response from Air Force after they heard me on the radio <laughs> talking about this. Yes, sir. I was uh, curious, like, with uh, talking about Project uh -huh. like that. Um, what branch, as far as you think, uh, what branch of the government do you think is the what's keeping this so secret? I mean, is it just like the head of the CIA and the head of the Supreme Court? Or, I mean, is there like a top secret group that's even higher than the president that's keeping all this around? Well, uh, like this gentleman indicated, there are elements within the CIA, I think, that have more of a need to know than the president. And I think this is one of those things where uh, it's very, it's held very tightly among, amongst a small group of people. Uh, now, having said that, uh, there, I think there is a, the cabal organization worldwide where they, they deal with intelligence people in other countries. And, and, but I think this is all being kind of uh, uh, orchestrated by intel people within our own government. Um, uh, that's, you know, I, I don't know any more than anybody else. <laughs> I, I'm just using my own reasoning and rationale to, to come to some of these conclusions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking, you know, most of the stuff that you presented is in the computer terms, the dark ages. There's no such thing as a vacuum tube anymore. So I would think that these systems would have been retrofit. If they go down, they come back up in less than a microsecond. 
You yeah. think so? Well, I'm a computer engineer, so I know how fast it is to reboot something. It sounds, what you say, the, the thing going down, it sounds like, well, you got to reboot it, bring it back up. We don't have to well, go sailing by the stars anymore. we got GPS. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like I said, I, this was 67. I haven't been associated with this for a long time. But what I can tell you is that in 2010, 50 missiles went down at Francis E. Warren Air Force Base. Uh, the Air Force said it was a computer glitch. <laughs> now, these systems are supposed to be very, 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 very reliable not subject to computer glitches because we have a computer glitch we could have nuclear war right so uh, that coupled with the fact that we do have air force people coming forward have come forward to uh, uh, actually hastings uh, robert hastings uh, and talked about the fact that um, they did see ufos overhead when this happened i mean nowadays I can picture 10 redundant systems failovers happening. That one goes down, boom, the next one takes over. Okay, then you explain why it was 50 went out. Yeah, I, you know, I can't explain it. Go ahead. Well, just to answer this, this gentleman's question, I work as a subcontract engineer, and I've worked on systems, companies that have 20, 30-year-old technology that they still use today mm -hmm. because they're too cheap to go out and upgrade everything. So, and, and, and some of those have been military installations. But anyway, but the question I had for you is since um, the UFOs seem to be over multiple nuclear type facilities, mm -hmm. is it, and I don't know, and I guess the question is, is did they have the technology to find out if some of the nuclear material was actually missing? If that's the reason why they were over there is to take some of the the nuclear material out of the weapons. I have never heard of such a thing as nuclear material being missing. Uh, I haven't even heard rumors. Still, but it was just, you know, yeah, thought. Never heard of it. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. Could you speak? Could you speak a little louder, please? Sure. I grabbed the magazine to read at lunch today on the way down here, and coincidentally, right next to an article I stumbled upon about um, former Air Force officers' um, UFOs tampered with nuclear missiles. It was an AOL article in uh, let's see, 2010, and your name is all over it. It's about the Washington. <laughs> Uh, just a couple of comments. Uh, Travis Walton, 
talks about beings that look very human. And uh, as a matter of fact, he thought they were going to help him out, get, get out of there, but they didn't. <laughs> so, um, and yeah, and, and, and there have been uh, witnesses that have said, uh, that, you know, abductees that have said that uh, they felt very close to a very exhilarated feeling uh, from these beings. A lot of people have seen uh, beings in in the craft through the windows. Uh, I know uh, Betty Hill, for one, and Barney and Betty Hill saw people in the craft through the windows. Uh, this fellow I mentioned, uh, or didn't even mention his name, in 1959 near Beale Air Force Base, he talks about <clears throat> UFOs coming down very close to him, and he could actually wave the beams. Uh, and they wave back. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, there have been many reports like that. Other questions? Yeah. What do you think it's going to take to, you know, go, just blow this whole thing up and go, wow, this is really, this is real? I mean, this is real. Uh, I mean, to the majority, you know, that, that 51% or, you know, whatever that it takes to, to you know, break the barrier or whatever. Yeah. The government is going to be a tough nut to crack as yeah, far as getting them to release the, this information. The, the, um, uh, what it would take would be a, an obvious landing, okay. I think. Yep. What is the purpose of the government being so secretive? I think uh, mainly uh, they can't control this phenomenon. They have no way of controlling the beings or the objects. Uh, and, and plus, uh, politically, they know, you know, they've got uh, and, yeah, blood on their hands, so to speak, because uh, they've known about this for so long, and it, they have recovered craft, they have recovered beings, and um, so politically, how, how would you uh, announce that? I, you know, a lot of reasons uh, the government is uh, collecting new technology, developing new tech uh, weaponry. Um, so there are probably a lot of reasons why the government doesn't want to come forward. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm brand new to MUFON, so my question may seem ridiculous to some people, but I want to know. Did they ever come up with any definite answer about crop circles? Other than? Wow. Yeah, that's a whole new subject. Uh, I don't know much about crop circles, although I'm going to England this summer, and uh, I'm going to be I'm going to be walking through the crop circles. So I'm excited about that. <laughs> yep. Can you describe those UFOs? You didn't actually see them, right? No, I didn't. They, from what you heard, were they like craft that had an orange glow around them, or were they like orbs of light, or can we like imagine something like? to something that we've seen somewhere? Yeah, I'll tell you, um, I've got an excellent video, which I got uh, when I was speaking in Peru um, a few years back. Um, somebody handed it to me, I don't even remember his name, but it's one of the best UFO videos I have ever seen. And uh, it shows, um, uh, someone taking uh, a video of a craft um, actually over d during a Catholic service. Uh, it was just outside this Catholic, um, actually it wasn't even a church, it was a, a basketball arena. But through the window you could see the UFO and um, he kept trying to focus on it and then he went outside and tried to focus on this thing. You could see him trying to focus and he couldn't focus on this object because of the um, you could say plasma around it. So you know, that's the kind of thing my uh, my guard saw. He said that there was this light around it, or this you know rarefied gas or plasma, and he couldn't make out what the structure of it was. But it was it was generally oval shaped, about 30 feet in diameter, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yes. Who are you going to your, uh, England to see the crop circles with? Who's, who's leading a group? Or are you going on your own? Oh, a lady by the name of Jennifer Stein. I don't know if you know her. 
Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had a question in regards to the guards. You mentioned that, that they were no longer able to fulfill, fulfill their duties uh, as a result of the experience they had. Yeah. And, and I'm sure it was a very traumatic experience. But it's something that I've heard before and I often wondered, uh, do you think that there might have been something more to that other than just natural uh, human response to this, this incident that perhaps even artificially uh, their fear mechanism might have been triggered and they weren't able to recover from that? Yeah, I think that's what happens when you undergo a trauma, you know. Um, it's, hard to, it's hard to recover from some of these traumatic experiences. And, I mean, from a, other than the experience itself, or something artificially that was amplified, amplifying this fear factor. Oh, you mean by the cabal? That's possible. Oh, by the crab. Well, your guess is as good as mine. I mean. <laughs> Can you enlighten us uh, as to, uh, you talked to extensively about where the bases were and how mm -hmm. they, you know, and, and, and in the 60s. Can you bring us up to present day and how that, uh, in the United States, those were laid out now? Uh, I don't have a knowledge of that, um, and I don't know if, if you, <laughs> is that like secret information? No, no, no. I, well, it, some of it may be, but uh, you, can go, you can go to the website, um, uh, let's see, um, Atomic scientists, uh, I got there it exactly. Um, yes, FAS. FAS, Federation of Atomic Scientists, I think. Yeah, they've, they've got a lot of information on there. Uh, we still have, uh, I know Malmstrom, for example, is still uh, up and running uh, as a missile base. Uh, so we still have a lot of these weapons out there. Like I said, we've, we've got over 2,000, but that includes submarines and, and bombers and and missiles. And making the assumption that some of the technology may still remain the same, and it's just, uh, do they change those things and upgrade them and, and you know, switch things out or, you know, <laughs> well, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm sure they've tried to make improvements over the years, yeah. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Did you work in radar ever before or after that? And after that, did you work in navigation or the navigation system or navigation? Radar? Uh, no, I didn't work in radar. I was um, uh, I worked as an aircraft controller we, where we used radar to control aircraft. But yeah. yes. What can you tell us about the cabal that you're referring to a few times here? <laughs> <laughs> I think they're an international organization. Uh, Is it highly, high, government? highly selected. They are. Uh, so secretive that um, even the president isn't un informed about their activities. Um, I think they include uh, some civilians uh, besides the military. And, but I think in, in our country, I think the CIA is very much involved. The CIA, and, uh, because there's a lot of evidence pointing in that direction. So are they a branch of the secret government? Or? Well, you could say they are a secret government because they don't res they don't answer to anybody. No. Uh, yes, sir. Just to, to uh, build on what you said, Stephen Greer just defined it as a crypto-fascist regime, regime transnational that doesn't report to any government. Uh, and from 1954 and beyond, he said, is when this got created. Mm -hmm. He spoke uh, at the conference that was held. Yeah, yeah. 1953 was the um, Robertson panel, and I think uh, uh, the CIA was the one that organized that as a disinformation program. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. The, it's very possible it could have started in 53, maybe even earlier than that, because the CIA started in 47. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Yes, hi. Thank you for your presentation today, for Thank compiling you. all that information. Uh, my name is Aurora Light, and I'm the author of Prepare for the Landing Spot, Human Appearance and Keys. Do you think that there are different fractions of people in the government who actually want to see this? 
Oh, yes, I certainly do. Uh, John Podesta comes to mind. Uh, I, think, I think he worked in the Clinton administration. Um, I, I'm certain that, um, you know, again, I was, I was looking through uh, McDonald's papers, and, uh, and there were uh, interested parties in the government, congressmen, that wanted to see this uh, discussed and openly, et cetera. In fact, uh, in 2001, when, uh, when I was involved with Stephen Greer and the Disclosure Project, uh, uh, we actually did visit Congress people, people in Congress. We actually sat down and, in their offices and, and discussed these cases, and there was interest, there was sincere interest in having a hearing. But, uh, 9-11 happened uh, uh, later that summer, and, and things changed. <laughs> but uh, mm, there are people, I'm sure, plenty that want to see this disclosure happen. Yeah. Some people are saying that even if there is a disclosure, it could be fake, like it would be controlled. It yeah, be right. Revealed. So should, right. We, should we be careful like we hear? Like, well, let's take one step at a time. Yeah. <laughs> let's get... <laughs> Let's get somebody together and say this is real, and then we'll go from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, for those of us who have never signed any kind of disclosure, you know, non-disclosure agreement or top secret agreement, um, can you just tell us a little bit of what your feelings are? I mean, is it a sense of loyalty? Is it a sense of fear that you keep a secret that's so huge? Or like, you know, you want to talk about it, but you can. What's the feelings? What goes through your head? Yeah, I, re I really did go through that um, balancing act. Uh, uh, I was a career officer, uh, as an Air Force Academy graduate. I took uh, my oath very seriously. Um, uh, the only reason I started talking about it because I thought the Air Force had declassified it. And then after I found out it wasn't at Echo, it was at Oscar, I thought about it again very seriously. But I felt uh, the public interest outweighed the government interest in this case. It's just a personal judgment on my part that it's more important that the public know about this than the government keeping it secret. But when you kept it secret, it was just that sense of loyalty, like I, that's the right thing to do. Oh yes, absolutely. Not yeah. so much fear of retribution. No, although they did point out that uh, I would be going to Leavenworth if I ever thought. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yeah. Uh, I can point to one incident. Um, in 1969, in the summer of 69, I was sent to wright Patterson Air Force Base to finish my master's degree in, in engineering. And um, I hadn't been long, I had, there was no real reason for that because I could have finished it at, at Mont in Montana. But they did, they sent me there to uh, wright Patterson Air Force Base. This was mid-1969, I remember the Condon report was out in January 69, but it, in June of 69, the Air Force still hadn't commented on it officially. Well, I was approached uh, soon after I arrived by uh, an old classmate, actually he was a class ahead of me at the academy, and uh, I knew him quite well. Um, and uh, uh, he was glad to see me. He said, by the way, I think we've got a job for you. And uh, I said, what? He said, well, uh, we'll talk about it. Uh, I'll talk to you later. And so I shrugged my shoulders. I, I was just there to finish my degree. I wasn't looking for, for a job in the Air Force at the time. I was still in the Air Force, but I just wanted to finish my degree. And so, um, a little while after that, I get a call from the uh, base psychiatrist's office. <laughs> and basically, they order me to the base psychiatrist to have uh, a talk. I said, look, I haven't complained about anything, mental problems or anything like that, so why do I need to see the base psychiatrist? Well, I don't know, but you're supposed to be there on this date and time, so I had to show up. I go in and uh, I tell the orderly, I said, I'm, uh, I don't know why I'm here. He said, well, uh, the psychiatrist will tell you. So I waited, he came back and said, uh, well, the psychiatrist will see you now. I said, no, 
I'm not going to go back and see him unless he comes out here and explains to me why I'm here. So he goes back, talks to the psychiatrist, comes back a little while later and says, you can go now, sir. Wow. <laughs> so uh, thinking back um, and knowing what I know about you know, other cases like um, the Bentwaters case, I think if I had gone back there and uh, he would have gotten me to talk about my UFO incident and probably made a little notation on my record and uh, had, had, would have that uh, on my medical record for the rest of my life. So, you know, I, that's the only thing I can point to where, you know, they tried to control the situation in that way. But again, it's speculative. Yes. You you said that you were going to be a career Air Force officer, mm -hmm. and then you ended up staying seven years or whatever. Did this incident have anything to do with you? No. Resigning from Air Force? No, I resigned over the Vietnam War. Any other questions? Yeah. The, the guidance systems that you're talking about, are they gyroscopes? Well, we had gyroscopes and so as part of it. You think maybe the gyroscopes were, were what was... Uh, were upset? Could have been. Yeah. Yeah. So some of the other times that the missiles were disrupted, it wasn't due to gyroscopic something or other. It was the electronics themselves that were disrupted. Well, uh, I don't know those details. It's just that... Uh, <coughs> I know we had gyros, and uh, the guidance and control system failed. That's about all I know. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have any ideas about the Jewish uh, boomerangs or triangles that fly at five points? Does it make any military sense for something that flies 30 miles an hour and can stop and get shot down easily? Any, any clue of that? <laughs> no, I don't have any. Any insight into that? <laughs> yes, sir. You think some of the craft that we've seen are actually uh, re-engineered technology? That, yes. That you know, it's part of, you know, Area 51, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, I'll tell you another story. I, <laughs> uh, this was mid '70s. I was working for FAA at the time, uh, flying. Uh, flying back and forth uh, different places and uh, happened to run into another one of my classmates and uh, we met in the aisle way of the, during the flight. Glad to see me. Actually, we'd been in the same squadron at the academy. And, uh, and uh, uh, the first thing, one of the things he said to me in the aisle way there was, you'll never guess what I'm flying. And I just jokingly said, what, UFOs? <laughs> yeah, this was mid-70s. And uh, all the blood drained from his face. <laughs> and then he said, How did you know? and he whispered in my ear, really, he said, MiGs. MiGs? Yeah, oh. 1976 MiGs. And then he walks back to the bathroom and... Um, uh, I said, uh, uh, I think he's going to wait for me after I get off the airplane uh, so we can get together. Uh, never seen him again. Never seen him since. So I take, I, I, you know, I just speculative again. Uh, I think the, Air, uh, the uh, Air Force has developed some sort of flying craft from this technology. Yeah. Yes, sir. There was an incident back in 65 uh, in Essex, New Hampshire, a UFO mm -hmm. incident, and there was some allusion to that it was connected to the Northeast blackout up in Mary uh, Falls, mm -hmm. and there was some apparent sightings of craft along the power distribution circuit. Have you see any connection between that kind of incident and shutting down nuclear power? Yeah. The, uh, yeah I, there are many, many incidents in the record of, of UFOs affecting um, power, uh, you know, 
in automobiles. Uh, they shut, been shut the power system down in automobile and uh, other other places. Yeah, they affect power. Yeah. There, there was no explanation mm -hmm. for, the, for the blackout in the Northeast. Yeah. I'm, I'm aware. Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. Oh, one more. Mm -hmm. I just wondered, uh, you know, after the fall of the Soviet Union and, and the Iron Curtain and so forth, in your travels, lectures, and gathering information, is there a lot more interchange from other various people in other countries, like Ukraine or China or wherever, and passing and exchanging this information with less government? Interference, at least their governments? Yeah I, I, yeah, I would like to make a comment about that. Um, when I was in Peru, um, uh, one of the gentlemen who had been a uh, military type uh, but was a civilian at the time did tell me that um, he was at a meeting um, with generals and including some U.S. Air Force officers. Uh, where they were exchanging information, UFO information, UFO sightings information. And uh, so that, again, leads me to some of the speculation I talked about, the cabal, that, yeah, there is uh, a working group within the militaries of various countries who, uh, that is exchanging information. Uh, very definitely, yeah. Yeah? Do you think that the United States is doesn't share their information and refuses to acknowledge anything, but these other countries seem to be setting up, you know, um, like Chile and that, they have their, right. you know. Yeah, and somebody that went to the International UFO Conference probably heard the Chilean general, Bermudez, is that his name? Well, yeah, it's, it's oh, France, yeah. It's, it's other countries too. And in France, in England, uh, yeah. they all say that they've released UFO information, but, but, together, but, we, we don't but <laughs> you got to you, you got to wonder uh, what the depth of the information they they are releasing, and um, uh, yeah, they they are working with each other. They're working with the U.S. government, I'm sure, on the release of this information. And, but I I wouldn't trust the kind of information that has been released as as being the the good stuff. The, the stuff they really have still classified. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, if in fact uh, there is evidence available that would establish you know, the existence of it, that everybody would be convinced of it. There's obviously a lot of people in the world, the government, that are well aware of that. And obviously, there's a concern about what would happen with the population if this information got out. In your opinion, what do you think the effect would be if, in fact, we were to come up and actually mm -hmm. convince Well, I'll give you two examples here. My, my daughter, and I don't know how this happened, is a born-again Christian. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me. <laughs> but, I, uh, but she knows about my UFO case, and, uh, and uh, uh, of course, she supports me 100%. And... Um, I, I asked her, that would it affect how, how you feel about religion? And she said no. And uh, she doesn't think any of that. As a matter of fact, I've been, uh, I have spoken to uh, uh, Christian groups, and uh, I don't see anybody panicking over the idea that this, this is a real thing. The other, the other evidence I'd point to is uh, I teach high school kids, high school level, and uh, every chance I get, I tell my story to them. Uh, none of them panic, uh, and none of them are fearful, and uh, the great percentage of them uh, absolutely buy into what I'm telling them. So, no, I don't think it would have an overwhelming effect publicly if, if this was disclosed. Uh, yeah. So do you think there's a chance that these people, uh, whatever they look like, are enemies of the Earth? There's always a chance. I wouldn't exclude that. I don't think so. But I would exclude it. Vice versa. 
Yes. Yes, sir. You're not afraid for your life any longer, are you? I know I'm going to die. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a matter of when. So, no, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. Yes. My question would be, you know, when you're speaking with these groups, and you're speaking with the children, I'm not so much concerned about them being concerned and afraid of the ETs or the... But what about the fear factor about the government? find that their fear factor the government is going up. Yeah, I think... I would think so, and that would be the uh, And that's why I think I, I, I was trying to make this point that um, uh, I don't think the public is going to tolerate the government holding so many secrets for much longer. I think we have got to take a stand on that, and uh, I think the UFO issue will fall out from that. But, uh, you know, we know this is real. We know you're holding these secrets. We demand to know, you know, and, I, and that, that, I think that's the push we need. We need to keep pushing in that direction. Yes? There's two different lines of knowledge, though, that both are impinge on the ET hypothesis. One is UFO disclosure. The other is public sciences exploration universe and exoplanets and study and so forth, trying to find empirical evidence that ET exists. It's, it's almost as if the government is managing, or the cabal, is managing what we're exposed to until public science catches up and uh, gets the public ready for the disclosure. Now, in your opinion, though, what would be the seminal event that you think would uh, tip the balance, and the second part part of that is, uh, as uh, Stephen Greer has talked about, uh, when when it comes out, what is that going to do to the, the uh, legal status of the secret, secret keeper? Yeah. Oh. I don't know about the legal questions, but uh, yeah, I, I get your point. If if, for example, you know, one of the Mars rovers uh, picked up some kind of a living thing on Mars, uh, uh, you know, I think that would be a seminal moment. Uh, it would prove that uh, yeah, life can exist elsewhere and very close close by. We we know that Mars has had a lot of water. And it takes water to have life, and um, if they have find evidence, even fossil evidence, uh, that life existed once on Mars, um, uh, again, they, this would be good impetus for disclosure, for government disclosure, I think, of, of the UFO phenomenon. Um, would it be an impetus for ET to come forward? Uh, well, you could argue that ET has already come forward. <laughs> there have been, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of people that have been abducted and uh, have talked to ET and seen ET. And um, but the question is, um, when does ET want to deal with us? Really, I mean, uh, openly. That, I think that's that's the main question, and I think. We're still uh, taking baby steps as far as civilization goes. We're, we're still learning how to deal with each other without killing each other. Yeah. Yes. When I was studying for my master's degree in military history, uh, we went into problems of modern uh, military history, uh, problems of modern warfare. They were more intelligence oriented than anything else. And one of the things we were studying is the popular buzzword is fourth generational warfare, i.e. guerrilla warfare. And one of the things they uh, brought up, they were analyzing the uh, former Soviet KGB, with, which had multiple departments of subversion and propaganda. And one of the things that was brought out was the introduction, if you want to call it like a spin doctor, of junk science. If you want to spin or you want to skew public opinion mm -hmm. or knowledge, yeah. you invest it with the cloak of the scientific discovery. Mm -hmm. All right. Oh, good point. And I think that's why I'm, I'm, I'm so adamantly against um, certain groups, who I won't mention their names, uh, 
who put stuff out there about the UFO phenomenon that they just don't have any backing for, and it's just speculative, and um, they keep pushing their their ideas and stories, and th this hurts disclosure. It really does. Divide and conquer. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, right. we're out of time. Thank you. My name is Jan Harzan. I'm the executive director for MUFON. We are a scientific research organization that basically collects sighting reports from the public and then goes and investigates them. Our mission statement as an organization is the scientific study of UFOs for the benefit of humanity. And we have three primary goals. We investigate UFO reports, we promote research into the UFO subject, and we educate the public on our findings.